You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the journalist and broadcaster, Jenny Kleeman, and the political editor of the Daily Telegraph, Ben Riley smith They'll be with us from now right up until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Metro leads with the jailing of Thomas Cashman for a minimum of 42 years for the gun murder of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell. Its headline, Gutless. This is the front of the mirror on that story, Mum's bravery and the cowardice of a killer. As the Express puts it, 42 years, life for Olivia's life. The eye leads with the strike by passport office workers, which looks certain to hit many people's holiday plans this summer. The Sun carries comments from television presenter Philip Schofield about his brother Timothy, who has been found guilty of sexually abusing a child. The Guardian carries an exclusive with claims of sexual misconduct amongst senior figures at the Confederation of British Industry. The CBI says it's already investigating. The FT reports that financial consultancy EY has been fined and banned from audit work in Germany for two years after its failings over the collapse of payments company Wirecard. While the Star has an update from the Duchess of York on the Queen's corgis, apparently they're no longer grieving for Her Late Majesty. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we're joined tonight by Jenny Kleeman and Ben Riley smith Welcome to you both. Let us start with the uh, biggest story in town this evening, and that is the uh, erstwhile President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, back in New York before attending court tomorrow morning. Jenny. Yes, he's treating this arraignment, this appearance in court, the first former president to face criminal charges. He's treating all of this as a kind of campaign rally. He made his travel plans uh, public, hoping that people would be thronging outside Trump Tower when he arrived today. I think there were fewer people than he was expecting today. Not that that's ever going to dampen his uh, completely unassailable self-confidence. Um, tomorrow he's going to appear at uh, the district court in Manhattan, the same court uh, as Harvey Weinstein and various other people who I'm sure he would not like to be linked to. Um, and he's going to find out what the charges against him are. They haven't been specified yet. Um, it's going to be something to do with document fraud related to the hush money uh, that he uh, allegedly paid to Stormy Daniels. Um, but his lawyers don't know what those charges are yet. He'll find out tomorrow. Um, he's going to be fingerprinted, apparently not handcuffed, perhaps not have his DNA taken, uh, but he may have his mugshot taken, and that will be a good thing for him because he is uh, using this, as I said, as, as a campaigning opportunity. A mugshot might be a, a good photograph to put on a poster to show how he is being victimised, how this is a witch hunt, um, how the Democrats are so terrified of him and his opponents in the Republican Party are so terrified of him um, that there is this conspiracy to try and lock him up rather than run for president again, as we know he plans to do uh, in the 2024 presidential campaign. So the circus is only just beginning uh, and it's going to carry on tomorrow. Uh, and Ben, do you uh, agree that he, he might be wanting to use this as a, a campaigning opportunity? Although we know that his lawyers have um, filed uh, a request not to have any media cameras in court. I mean, he's clearly already trying to do that. I mean, I actually was based at in Washington for three years covering Trump with the 2020 election. He has this unbelievable ability as a politician to take bad news and do a kind of jujitsu move on it and turn it to his political advantage. So you've seen that in the last couple of days, the way his campaign have fired out these fundraising emails, trying to get as much cash as possible. Um, I think so much depends what that image is going to be tomorrow. Is it going to be a mugshot? Is it going to be him coming into court? Does he look defiant? I mean, I suppose the jury's going to be out, well, literally on the case, but also in the court of public opinion. There is a whole swathe of uh, voters in the country who are obviously very critical uh, of Donald Trump. The critical bit for whether he can become president again is the Republican Party base. Two years on, 
from leaving the White House. He still has an unbelievable grip on that party. Um, and so he is clearly hoping to use this moment um, to turn himself into a martyr, really, and say, look, the state, the status quo, the establishment is coming after me, coming after us. And that's why I need to champion our movement again in um, at the next election. Uh, Jenny, you touched on um, the uh, issue of his popularity and perhaps the, the, the crowds outside Trump Tower not being to the, the size that he might have thought uh, that they would be. Um, do you think that this is affecting his, his popularity? I think the people who like Donald Trump are going to love him all the more uh, as he strides defiantly into the courthouse. He's a very polarising figure, and uh, I, I don't think that this is going to alienate the people who already love him. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how he reacts tomorrow. He is used to surrounding himself only by sycophants. He does not like to be challenged. And, uh, you know, these are people who have built up a very serious case against him that's going to be presented to him in court. Um, but he, as Ben says, he'll spin it to his advantage. That's what he does. He is a master of political spectacle and he's using this to present himself um, a, as a martyr. And uh, I can't, I'm, I'm excited to see if the mugshots get released, what he does with them, because no doubt he will turn them to his advantage. There'll be people wearing t-shirts uh, with those mug, that mugshot on uh, as soon as those pictures are released. Yes, uh, we, we uh, wait to see what uh, shots we will get tomorrow. Let's move to the Express, Ben, and this is the sad news of the passing of the former Chancellor, former Conservative Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, at the age of 91. Yeah, well, this story has only just broken late uh, this evening. A lot of political journalists scrambling to get it on the front pages. I mean, he was a titan of Conservative politics. Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor from 83 to 89, and one big core part of his legacy that actually taps into what's happening today in British politics is tax as a tax slasher. So his 1988 budget was famous. It got rid of the 60% top rate of income tax, drops down to 40%. Um, and obviously tax is a issue in the Conservative Party that is dividing opinion. The tax burden is going to the highest point it's ever been since the years after the Second World War. Rishi Sunak says he wants to bring down taxes, but only once he's got inflation under control. There's a whole wing of the party uh, with Liz Truss still at their head, really, and Boris Johnson kind of flirting with that group as well, who are saying, no, you've got to start cutting tax now. We saw a bit of a rebellion um, at the last budget. I think the autumn is going to be another crunch point. So it's interesting watching all the names in the party senior names coming out this evening and praising Lawson because it does have that um, bite in the current political atmosphere. Yes, uh, Jenny, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson saying that Nigel Lawson was a fearless and original flame of free market conservatism and also the present Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying that he, he hung a portrait of uh, Nigel Lawson up in his office when he was Chancellor. Yeah, he was literally a pin-up. Nigel Lawson, a pin-up uh, for the Conservative Party and for Conservative chancellors. I mean, he, he provided the kind of intellectual heft behind Thatcherism. He was a massive figure in the 19, 1980s. Um, and, and uh, you know, he, he was a huge symbol of post-war Britain and economics in, in, in post-war Britain. He championed privatisation. He became a, a, a big proponent of, of Brexit. And he um, he only retired from the House of Lords in December. He's lived a really, truly uh, remarkable life. I met him when I was a student and he was warm and approachable and uh, interested and engaged in, in, in young people. Even then, uh, you know, he, he had long since uh, retired from frontline politics uh, then. Uh, but he had a very turbulent time. He resigned in 1989 after some, some very serious disagreements with Margaret Thatcher. He precipitated her fall from power in, in many ways. And they had this uneasy relationship. I was having a look through um, some of the obituaries just before we came on air. And uh, Margaret Thatcher begrudgingly uh, says in, in her memoirs that in 1983, she says... I had by now come to share Nigel's high opinion of himself. So even though they didn't get on, uh, she couldn't help um, but respect him, uh, even though he, he played a very large part in her downfall. Yes, uh, many others had a, a very high opinion of him also. Let us move on to the Metro um, and their front page, the headline gutless, uh, referring to Thomas Cashman um, on his uh, sentencing today, Ben. 
Well, there are some of those criminal cases that just kind of cut through British society and really resonate with people, I think. And this is clearly one of them, partly because it involves the death of someone so young, Olivia, who was nine. But also today you saw the scene of the sentencing of her killer. He got 42 years, but he wasn't present in court. And clearly that seems to have caused uh, distress and frustration. I think a lot of people across the country are wondering, well, how can that be that a killer who has taken such a young life and is given life in prison and doesn't have to be in court to hear that sentence? And actually, one of the debates that's coming out, um, there's a report in our paper tomorrow, Dominic Raab, the Justice Secretary, has talked about punishing convicted criminals who don't turn up for their sentencing. And there's pressure now on him to speed through uh, that reform. So it sounds like that might be an area of political debate coming out of this um, horrific tragedy that might play out in the next couple of days. Yes, and it also meant, Jenny, that him not being in court, he, he didn't get to hear the impact statements from, from the family, which is, is really important. Not only did he not get to hear those victim impact statements that are incredibly important for the family, he forced the family to wait. They were all standing in court waiting for him to deign to, uh, to make his appearance. And when it was clear that he wouldn't, Cheryl Corbell, Olivia Pratt Corbell's mother, gave a really moving, moving speech. She was holding a teddy made out of an old pair of Olivia's pyjamas. And this was supposed to be her moment to, to confront the man who murdered her child and shot her in such a horrific way. And he, he denied her even that. And he, he is truly a monster. And uh, she paid tribute to the witnesses, the incredibly brave witnesses that came forward and uh, allowed for Thomas Cashman's conviction. But we know that the two guns used in the attack still haven't been seized. They're still out there. So there's still room uh, for... The community to come forward and 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 do more uh, for Olivia Pratt Corbell's family who have had to endure so much at the hands of these people. Yes, and uh, continue as they say um, their own life sentence. Uh, Jenny and Ben, for the moment, thank you. We are going to take a break. Coming up, the end of the road for e-scooters. Parisians vote to ban them from the streets. Stay with us for more. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman and the political editor of the Daily Telegraph, Ben Riley-Smith. Welcome back to both of you. Let us have a look at the Metro and uh, teachers on strike. Uh, they're to stage more strikes after they've uh, rejected the latest uh, government offer. Uh, new dates Thursday, April the 27th and Tuesday, May the 2nd, Jenny. Yes, right into exam season, there'll be a lot of parents uh, holding their breath over all of this and, and uh, you know, keeping a few expletives in. Uh, teachers were offered a, a £1,000 one-off payment and a 4.3% pay rise, which unions have have uh, unanimous, well, almost unanimously, uh, overwhelmingly rejected uh, 98%. Uh, of, of union members, teachers union members uh, rejected this offer. Part of this is to do with the fact that teachers in, in uh, Wales and Scotland have been offered a much better deal. I think in Scotland they've been offered a 14% a pay rise. Um, and so it, it, it's far less generous. But this is a really serious standoff. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, had said that uh, if the teachers refused this offer, that £1,000 one-off payment wouldn't be on the table yet again. Um, but it's incredibly difficult. I think a lot of parents have a lot of sympathy with the teachers. They haven't had a pay rise for a long time. They have had to struggle uh, through some very difficult years of COVID, but so have children um, as well. And at a time when we are trying to get school attendance back up to what it was pre-COVID, um, I know certainly at my children's school, they've had terrible uh, rates, rates of attendance. It's a very difficult message to, to be giving to children that you need to, uh, that they must come to school, it's important for their education, but also that, that teachers are, are, are going to strike. Uh, for, for pay. So it's a very difficult scenario for, for teachers and for parents as well as children. Uh, and Ben, let's move on to uh, another strike and this time the uh, passport office, which is going to stymie a lot of people's uh, summer holidays, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, I think the education strikes are only two days when you look at the passport strikes. It's five weeks, I believe, 1,800 workers. And in the eye tomorrow, they're suggesting months could be 
Uh, sorry, the delays could be up to three months. So anyone planning a holiday whose passport is at risk of um, expiring, that is scary news. Um, and having known some people who've gone through it, I mean, it's the uncertainty of when you send off your passport, not exactly knowing when it's going to come back, because these things tend to be done um, over post rather than going in with the passport and having it processed that day. I mean, yeah, terrible timing. Um, Easter holidays uh, are imminent. Summer holidays just around the corner. And again, it kind of links to the COVID thing. You know, for two best part of two years, families in this country had really difficult times. And one thing they couldn't really do was travel overseas. And now with the borders back open and the pandemic beginning to pass into the distance, there's going to be a whole nother frustration on top of the changes of Brexit, on top of the lockdowns that prevented travel uh, that are coming for families in the next couple of months. Yes, I'm beginning to regret not going in for that uh, in-person appointment. I have a passport in transit as we speak. Let's um, finish off with the no. FT, uh, Jenny. E-scooters e to be banned in Paris. Why? Well, you know, people in Paris, they do things in a, in a very serious way, as we know. And there was a poll. Uh, uh, for just 4% of the Parisian population voted, the e-scooter manufacturers say, but they, they voted uh, to make rented e-scooters illegal. They're fed up of uh, these scooters littering the streets, blocking doorways. Uh, the e-scooter manufacturers say, of course, that Paris is going backwards, that this is the future of travel for tourists and for uh, younger people. But, you know, I have had to push prams around roads, around pavements that have been blocked because someone's chucked a, an e-scooter that way. So there has to be a better way of managing it all, but you can imagine Par Parisians couldn't deal with such ugly things on their streets, so uh, they're going to ban them. <laughs>